Podcast. I'm your host, the Mortal Kombat fan, Tim. And with me, as always, is our co-host, the lore master, Yanni. Welcome, Yanni. Thanks, fan, Tim. And welcome to Daniel Piscina, or Master Piscina, also known in the Mortal Kombat community as not just the original Johnny Cage, but also Sub-Zero, Scorpion, Reptile, Smoke, and even Noob Cybot. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to have you on today. Yeah, so... Master Piscina, normally we like to start off by asking how Mortal Kombat has kind of affected you throughout the years. For you, I mean, it's completely different because you've been there from the very beginning. So rather than jumping straight into Mortal Kombat, let's kind of talk about your history before Mortal Kombat. Um, we just kind of want to kind of set the stage of how this all started. Um, so before Mortal Kombat, you were already really well versed in various martial art techniques. Um is it true that you kind of started martial arts back in 1970? I started martial arts in 1969. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. So a while ago, uh, that my journey with the martial arts started, uh, way back then, but you know, uh, started, I started with, uh, judo, a little bit of Shotokan karate and a little bit of, uh, Shotokan jujitsu or samurai. How did you get started with martial arts in the beginning? Well, I have two older brothers who are uh, eight and 10 years older than I am. So me, uh, we go for an, I had me and uh, my brother, uh, Carlos, who's Raiden, uh, too. I am eight years older than him. So it's kind of weird. We all, uh, my older brothers goof around and say, you guys are the honeymoon guys. You know, <laughs> Where all of a sudden, uh, mom and dad decided to have a honeymoon, you know, so, <laughs> So, uh, but when I was, a uh, when I was a kid, about six years old, my father and I used to watch a movie, uh, with, with, uh, Charlie Chan, the detective. It was a black and white, uh, episode, one hour episode where this Chinese detective would solve a mystery in different parts of the world. And during one of the episodes, I recall like him throwing a guy, there was a big, this big guy messing with him and he's a short round guy. So, but he threw him, he did a judo move and threw him. And then I just felt so fascinated with how he was so small and able to throw that guy that basically I bugged my father for lessons. In the end, uh, I have to say my motivation was, Oh, I'm going to be able to throw my bigger brothers. Because they, would <laughs> at everything. they would beat my butt at everything. We'd race, they'd win. You know, we'd do this, they'd win because naturally they're older. They're already a little, uh, you know, mature. So I was like, man, I'm going to get them, these guys with this. Did it work? I don't know. I never got to throw them. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to fake throw my father. Looking back at it, you know, he was like, oh, I could teach you that because my dad served in the U.S. military uh, during the Korean conflict, Korean War. But he would show me how to, and then he flipped over. And then I wanted to do it again, but because I was like, wow, it really works. But my dad wouldn't let me. And, you know, just looking back at that, I probably heard him because it wasn't, you probably really didn't, you know, wasn't proficient at the martial arts, you know, being in the military for that long. They're, they're more used to firing arms. So looking back, he let me probably throw his back out. <laughs> <laughs> so you moved from those martial arts into the uh, Kung Fu as well with both Shaolin and Wushu, I think. It's... Yeah. Yeah. Actually, um, the judo school, the judo karate center that I was uh, attending, which was about uh, a couple miles from my house, used to take the bus back then. I was like, you know, I remember my dad driving me to judo lessons. And then eventually he was like, you got to learn how to take the bus. So at 11 years old, I was taking the bus to judo lessons uh, three times, three or four times a week. So that place was relatively close to my uh, home, my parents' home. It was one straight shot down Archer Avenue, if you know Chicago. And But that school closed. And so my dad was like, man, this is really good for him. It keeps him out of trouble, kind of, you know, gives him discipline, uh, something to work it, exercise good for him. So my dad found a kung fu school in Chinatown. And I oh, got, wow. to, yeah, I got to, and I'm about 12 minutes from Chinatown on the opposite direction of where the judo school was. So I could take a bus there. But uh, the instructor was Wei Lun Choi. He's like grandmaster of Luho Bafa. Later on, Dan Asanto, Bruce Lee's student, would fly into Chicago 
to study with this guy, Kung Fu with this guy, because he was really, really good. That's wow. amazing. Like, and so how long did you end up studying Kung Fu? Uh, uh, till the, till present day. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. They're just going to say yes. <laughs> I stayed with him for two years and then he moved up north, which I was not uh, capable of following up there. But, you know, I kept practicing by myself until I found uh, basically a, a guy doing seven star praying mantis which is a uh, uh, Shaolin style, Shaolin Seven Star Praying Mantis. It's a uh, Northern style. Uh, so I studied there for like five or six years until I got the contemporary uh, Wushu bu uh, bug, where it's more physical and acrobatical. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say, it, you know, it's, it, back then it's well-rooted in traditional martial arts, traditional Wushu. Meaning uh, a lot of people think the wushu is a, is a different than kung fu. No, kung fu is like skill and time or skill and work. While wushu means war, shu is art. So wu is war, shu is art. So it's war art. So, But, you know, you can have wushu and not have kung fu because kung fu is the hard work. That's what makes you good. So, you know, if you do taekwondo, you can have kung fu. If you do uh, car repair, and are, have a high level of that. You could do Kung Fu or computer work, you could do Kung Fu. Photography, you could also have Kung Fu. So uh, the distinction that we make uh, training in China is their traditional Wushu and contemporary Wushu. So I really like the contemporary Wushu because it's all that flying stuff, acrobatic stuff. It's all the stuff that looks really, really cool, but is relatively difficult to, to, uh, to achieve just because you, know, you have to be stronger. You have to be more flexible. You know, everything is just physically more than more than people would think. So started learning that and uh, just continued my journey, you know, really competed with that stuff. And eventually went back to traditional uh, Kung Fu as I got older. Or wushu. Yeah. Did, did you have a particular technique that I mean, or even today, is there a particular technique that you enjoy more out of uh, the Kung Fu and the Wushu that you've been working with? I like, I like, uh, I, it's, uh, two things for external. I like the Northwestern systems and the Northwestern systems are not so known outside of like, uh, uh, outside of China. Like when you see, uh, they're rarely shown in cinema too. So I like that because it's still something new and trend setting. And, and, you know, when you see stuff, you usually see Northern or Southern style in movie. But, you know, these Northwestern styles, uh, which are the older styles in China, uh, have a different kind of flavor to them. They're like really, really fast paced and they uh, require a lot of uh, physical conditioning, not like just weightlifting, like you, you hit stuff. Like they're known to like, oh, uh, I have a 50 pound metal bag that I kick and punch. So that's one of the requirements is to, to get your hands in such a condition. Uh, for this stuff that it it it's really why what makes it really super dangerous but it does take a long time so i like the northwestern stuff uh fanzi chuan uh dung bay piqua for people listening they could look those up and then for internal uh i like uh yin fu bagua and bagua was featured in the last airbender mm -hmm. as as kind of the style that that the airbender does Okay, yeah, yeah. So it, more of the uh, like acrobatical flying type things. Yeah, a lot of body dodging. That is like, oh, they they rarely block. They do a lot of dodging because when you're blocking, you can't strike. But when you're dodging, you can strike. So it's and that's like, exactly what the whole airbender style was supposed to be, right? Dodging rather than blocking and everything. Yeah, you managed. Like, it's quite the the departure from what we're talking about, but it kind of leads on. You eventually got a role as a foot soldier in the nineteen ninety one. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, Secret of the Ooze. How did you land that role? Um, we were at a tournament called Battle of Atlanta, one of the biggest tournaments in North America. And we heard that there were people looking for uh, stuntmen. Because back in those days, regular uh, an, uh, an actor couldn't really do their own stunts. It was just too dangerous. You know, now with CG and, and wire work and stuff like that, a lot more mainstream actors or famous actors can do their own stunt work because there's a lot more safety than there was back then. 
So there was a group looking for martial artists. You know, we didn't know what movie, but myself and Hosang and uh, Rich Divizio Kano, we made an agreement. Hey, we were like, if they approach us about doing a movie, we'll, we'll mention the other two. You know, the other two people, they, they're really cool too. You should watch them and do that. So uh, eventually they uh, uh, approached Hosang. And Ho Sung was like, oh, you know, thanks for choosing me. You got to check out these two guys. So eventually through that tournament, uh, we got to go down to North Carolina for four months and do stunt works on turtles. That's so cool. Wow. And then uh, Ho Sung, he ended up playing one of the turtles, didn't he? Yeah, he's uh, Raphael. That's awesome. <laughs> it was really, it was cool. It was what about, a good experience. What about Richard? Who did he end up playing? He did uh, uh, some stunts for the foot soldiers. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's definitely a height limitation, too, with every, everything. With <laughs> because, you know, if you're, you know, if you're 5'8", you're going to be like a six foot turtle, which is not the look they're looking for. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I guess let's go ahead and start jumping into, I mean, from there, you got involved with Mortal Kombat. So before we kind of really deep dive into this who is your favorite mortal kombat character my favorite mortal kombat character i'm gonna adjust my chair a little bit thank you uh actually it is the character that is now known as johnny cage before when we were filming he didn't really have a name he was just danny it was just me my name yeah you know uh, you know so the uh uh and i i like him because he's the father of all characters you know a lot of people uh, an example is you see videos of the creation of Mortal Kombat 1. Those aren't even like the first 60 hours of video. Mm. We erased all that stuff to save money. You know, John, oh, wow. and I, John and I spent about 60, 70 hours filming martial arts stuff to try to figure out what would work for the for this game because there never was a, there wasn't a game like this. There was Pit Fighter, but those guys didn't really know how to fight. And the, the action was a little choppy. And John wanted us to look more like our original idea when we pitched it to Midway and Ed was we wanted it to look like Dragon Slayer, mm -hmm. like a really smooth video, like a Kung Fu movie, but a smooth, like a smoothness to, to it. But uh, that technology, they were, didn't want to spend on this game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well yeah. We've we've got a lot of old school listeners on this show, as well as people who've actually just recently discovered Mortal Kombat. So you're kind of talking about the beginning. Why don't you tell us how it actually all began with Mortal Kombat in '92? Um, so my brother uh, is an is an artist. He likes to draw and sketch, sculpt, and so is John Tobias. And sometimes they would be at my parents' kitchen table or at a friend's kitchen table drawing. And I really enjoyed watching both of them work because they, it's a skill that I don't have. So any skill that I do not have, you know, it fascinates me because I know like, oh, to be good at martial arts, you, you spend a lot of time and sacrifice a lot of things for that. Mm -hmm. And so when I see a, 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 another skill, I'm like, man, it's really cool because they do, they're doing the exact same thing that I'm doing, but just in a different set. So I would watch them draw and stuff like that and kind of be like, wow, you guys are, you know, really going to be something, some, you know. But when John was in, I'm going to say in art school, he had to do a, a movie project because, you know, you're in art school, you get diverse stuff, not only drawing, you're going to do, you know, and sculpting, you're going to do other forms. So he called me up and he's just like, hey, I want to shoot a kung fu movie. You know, and I and I was like, cool, let's let's do that. And he, he's like, I got all this equipment from my school. Maybe you, me, and uh, uh, you, myself, which is Tobias, uh, Rich, and Carlos can go out to the forest preserve and just kind of shoot a kung fu movie guerrilla style. No skit, no no uh, no choreography beforehand. We'll just make it up when we get there. You know, that way I could have it all in the can and get get it edited, and this will be for a, a you know for for a school grade. So I was like, okay, cool. So he picked us up in his dad's car and we went out to the forest preserve to shoot this movie. But when we're, when we, we didn't have a location. So we're kind of just looking around. We saw a location. We started making a left into it on a two lane high, uh, two lane uh, roadway. It wasn't a street because the speed limit was like 45. So it's not, 
you know, so it's not like 30 in the city. It's, you know, you could go a little faster. So anyway, sorry for the long story, but we are making a left and this guy tries to pass us on the left. So he hits John Tobias's dad's car and we spin around a few times and land in a ditch. And literally, if it was six inches closer to the front end, he would have killed Rich Tano. Tano would have been dead. The car was totaled. Car was totaled. We never finished that project, but we I got to be friends with John because we had to wait like four hours for a tow truck. And we were just taught we were just sitting on the road waiting for a tow truck. And we just talked about like life and you know, too, that experience. We were like, holy cow, we could almost die. You know, and that bring that thing really brings people together. Yeah. You know, quicker than just hanging out and having a drink, you know, because you're like, holy cow, we could <laughs> we could that could have been it. Because you can see what it is. But anyway, uh I would say a few years later after right shortly after Turtles, John calls me up and he's just like, Hey, remember that that movie thing we wanted to do? And I started laughing. I was like, Yeah, man, we you know, Rich almost died. How can you <laughs> You not remember that. And so he's like, well, I work for this Midway Games and I got an idea. To, I want to do a real martial art fighting game with real martial artists. He says, it's never been done. He goes, will you help me do this project? And I was like, uh, cool. And I'm like, well, what are you going to pay? You know, because he was working for a company. He's like, well, I can't pay you too much. He goes, but, you know, any ideas you have, we're going to throw in the game. And uh, naturally, because, you know, I need all this help with all the martial arts side, you'll, you'll, you'll have credit for choreography and doing anything you do, you know, footage and stuff like that will all go to you to use for your, your reel. So you can take credit for this project because it's going to be a small project, 200 arcade cabinets. You know, I have some drawings come in. I want you to choreograph some fight scenes and we're going to take the drawings and that visualization of what I want in a game and we're going to make a presentation to to Midway. And I was like, cool, cool, cool. So, you know, we went into Midway. Uh, we played a lot of games for a couple hours because it was free. We didn't have to put <laughs> in. So I was like, I'm playing free games. <laughs> you know, John showed us some sketches and then I choreographed some fighting sets and movements. And then he took that and presented it to uh, Midway. And about three days later, he called me up and said, hey, they're interested in making a fighting game. They want to, you know, they want to hear more. He goes, so bring your best ideas and, uh, and just be ready to answer questions on how you think this video game can, you know, be, be created. He goes, because nobody's done this before. So uh, I was like, okay. And so we arranged to have, uh, I think it was uh, lunch, lunchtime uh, with their representative, which was Ed Boone. So Ed sat, sat across the table from myself, uh, Carlos and Rich. We brought them along uh, and John and Ed sat on the other side of the table and we kind of presented the, uh, like a deeper pitch of things we wanted in, in the game. Like, you know, we were, we were, we were geeks. So we already, you know, loved anime, you know, loved uh, comic books and things like that. So we were always, we were saying, oh, it's cool. We got to put in, you know, x-rays or, or like in uh, uh, Fist of the North Star or in uh, Dragon Ball, you know. So we were just say, having all these ideas uh, going out there because John was just like, before we met, John was like, we got to give them the best ideas. Otherwise, they will not, they will say no. He goes, and I really want to do this project, even though it's 200. He goes, I think this would be a really cool project to do. And I'm like, yeah, because, you know, I'm going to be doing a video game. Holy cow. I can't you know, <laughs> believe it. So, you know, we, during the pitch, it was when I, I told John, you know, originally he wanted like the Japanese uh, ninja, Japanese ninja clan. And I was like, John, we need to change it to the Lin Kuei. And he's like, what? And I was like, there's Chinese ninjas. And they're called the Lin Kuei. And they don't look like Japanese ninja, ninjas. They have this type of armor. On and stuff like that. And I had a book called, uh, man, I, I think it was uh, Art of the Vagabond or something like that. I showed mm. him the book, the Lin Kuei, and I introduced him to the Lin Kuei and said, you know what, this will be really unique. It won't be like a regular, you know, since this is this video game, nothing like this has ever happened. This 
introducing these characters into it will also be like never seen before. It'll make this game so unique. And so John was like, okay, cool, cool. Uh, he, he's, he wanted to borrow my book. And in the end, I said no, but I took him to the store. We went to the store together to buy the book, in which we bought like a, which for just for reference and stuff like that. But then, you know, I, I looked across and I asked, you know, I was like, uh, you know, what do you think? I asked Ed, what do you think? And uh, Ed just kind of tightened his lip and kind of just looked away from me. And I was like, oh, no, they're not going to do this game. And then two days later, John calls me up and said, hey, they like the idea of a fighting game, but they're not going to do our game. They're going to go to a mainstream game because it'll make more quarters. And I was mm. like, oh, yeah, it, it, in the end, is it about the quarters? Because that's it's an arcade. It's got to make quarters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they were like, uh, they're going to get John claude Van Damme to do a mainstream fighting game. And then I was like, okay. And then I was just like, I was like, okay, but make sure that you guys do not use my Lin Kuei idea for Van Damme. Because if it ever gets to, if we ever get to do this game, this game we think we're thinking of, I want to use it for that. He's like, okay. He goes, yeah, it's your idea. We're going to do that. So months later, I get a phone call from him again. He goes, like, he's like, hey, will you still help me create my game? And I was just like, yeah, what happened? He goes, well, he started laughing. He was like, Van Damme wants money. And these guys, <laughs> they want to give him a percentage. And I was like, nah, dude, that's not, he's not going to like that because you can manipulate, even I knew, like, you couldn't manipulate money and be like, this game made no money, but it made, you know, yeah. it made a lot of money. So yeah. I was like, okay, yeah. So he was just like, so I was like, okay, well, what do we do? And he's like, well, we got to create a pathway to the game. So just show up tomorrow and be ready to just film. And let's film all, all this martial arts stuff, anything you could think of, and we'll take a look at it and see if we can create uh, a pathway into this game. So, uh, so John and I spent, like I said, about five or six, eight, uh, eight to twelve-hour days just filming moves and looking at it, you know, and getting kind of ideas of what we can do, would do with before, after that six, after about the five or six day, uh, those days we invited Ed to take a look at what we came up with, see how to program it, you know? So it was kind of cool. You know, you had John who really thought of the idea and, and uh, he let me do the martial art part. And now we were ready to ask the programmer of how, how we can create this game. Was it uh, all that footage at first? Was it just of you? That, that's what you were talking about earlier. Just basically Johnny Cage or, or Daniel Piscina footage. Uh, yes, me dressed as just in sweatpants and a t-shirt, no costume. Uh -huh. uh, I, I, re, I laugh because the first day, you know, Mortal Kombat, when I see it, you know, even in the movies, when I see people acting like us in the movies, I start, I smile a lot because I remember the stories about how things were created. Hmm. So when I see, you know, Scorpion doing, doing the rope dart or taking his head off and, and you know, putting somebody on fire or Sonya's kiss to death or Raiden flying at you. There's all stories how those things were created, which are hilarious. So even when the actors are acting like us, I just smile because I'm like, oh my God, that was so hilarious. You know, <laughs> even today in, the, in the, mo the new movie, when I watch it, it makes me smile because I'm like, oh my God, that was so funny to create that. You know, they the people just don't know that type of thing. But so... When we set up the, uh, and two, it was Tobias's dad's high aid camera. It wasn't even a studio camera. Uh huh. So when we set it up, I remember the first day, John set up the camera after we cleared out of space and a flat wall to film against. And he looked at me and he said, do something cool. <laughs> and that's how it started. That's how it started. Started doing movements. And he was like, wait a minute. And then he had high, medium, low. And that's what that was his that's what his guideline was. Mm -hmm. High medium, and low. And so we were just goofing around trying to do, you know, taking a look at different kicks of how they look and try to uh you know, try to figure out how to create this game. When you guys actually so after everything was approved and you started making things, was there much character background or was that all kind of developed right on set? Most of it was done on on set. Like uh, uh, for the Johnny Cage, you know, 
and again, this is my perspective, and I understand that the, the company has their perspective. But when we were going to do Johnny Cage, he is modeled off of Daniel Rad from Iron Fist Kung Fu. Mm-hmm. So that's the what I, when I was filming it, that's who I thought. A month later, as a gag, we put in some move from Van Damme, just because he said no to the project. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and we wanted to make a gag. So, and, but that was already like a month after we've already been working on the game properly. So a lot of people are like, oh, it's based on Van Damme. No, not really. You know, when I was filming, there was no mention of Van Damme for about a month until we decided to make this joke. So, <laughs> so and two, it was like we were just allowed to do whatever we want. Because mm-hmm. it was one, it was, we didn't know what we were doing. We collaborated. You know, I was like, uh, you know, for Johnny Cage, John's like, walk out and hit a fighting stance. So I walk, start walking out. I'm like, well, I'm a Hollywood guy. So I'm just waving to the crowd. And then I get in a fight <laughs> You know, and by then we already knew what kind of fighting stance we needed because we were like, you can't be too low because if you stand up and then throw a kick, that's an extra frame to the movement Mm. that, you know, memory will take up. And we got to save as much memory as we can, you know, because we wanted to make it smooth as we can. So even what we see today is not even close to what we wanted it to be. You know, it just Mm -hmm. changed later on. When, when Ed was just like, hey, we can't do it like that. There's no way. We don't have enough time. We're only doing 200 cabinets, you know, for us to really do this stuff. You know, he was just like, you can't do stuff like that. But uh, so we already have, you know, kind of like that, uh, you know, our first day of filming, we only had overhead lights, you know, moving back and forth. Did that for two days, uh, you know, as, as uh, the Danny character, which later on turned out to be Johnny Cage. Uh, doing that. And then when we looked at the film again, John was just like, we can't use this. And I was like, why not? He goes, look at you. He goes, when you're close to the camera, you're bigger. When you're further away, you're small. And I was like, oh yeah. And he's like, we got a, I, I got a mark where we shoot from. And I was like, you know what? I got to mark, start marking the floor for different references to know what I'm doing. So basically, you know, uh, John marked the tripod for the camera. And then I started you know, if you look at the making, you'll see a little square. Mm. And that's basically me just growing each time, you know, saying, oh, the foot, feet are here. How far can I go forward with the lighting? How far can I go back before the lighting changes? How far can I jump up before my head, the lighting changes? So light changing had a lot to do with a lot of uh, uh, making the frames uh, clear, had a lot to do with how we uh, videotape stuff, you know, it, it, sometimes it would take hours because literally you would throw a punch like this. And then, you know, I do it like 30 times and then I'd look at it and then I change it like this, just a little bit, just to kind of see the way the light hits. You know what I mean? If yeah. you go like, you see, you know what I mean? See these two knuckles up here, you see more, but if you go like this, you see all four knuckles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just experimenting with different hand positions, different strikes, different beat, Foot technique. So a front kick, we filmed it like at the beginning, we filmed it like nine different ways to see what would kind of, how it would turn uh, turn up. So it was like a lot more than people think like, oh, you just threw a kick. No, it wasn't like just throw a kick. You know, we had to shape everything and uh, overcome a lot of different obstacles. Also, Mortal Kombat's really famous for each of the characters having their own style. Um, like their own techniques to it. It, it. Can you tell us a little bit about how that ended up in the game? Yeah, because two, when we, uh, when John was like, hey, who else can we get to do the game? You know, cheap, I can't pay them. And I was like, oh, we could get a song, we could get Tony Marquez to be in the first game. He was going to be the, the Lin Kuei, but he broke his toe, so he wasn't the Lin Kuei. And then we naturally we got Carlos and then uh, I recall early on, John wanted a female character, unsure of what it would be, but he wanted like, oh, we got to get a female character and maybe we could get uh, an African-American uh, character in the, in the first game, I, I, as I recall. But, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole thing was, you know, it was just kind of when you're doing, when we're doing stuff, we wanted to look better than the next guy. Yeah. 
So it was all about one upping each other. Because two, we didn't we w- didn't just film, you know, the Johnny Cage character and he was done. We filmed the basic thing and we had to get to the next character, which was Kano, and then Kano would come up with something and then really be like, oh, because originally when we were doing stuff, we were doing stuff, we we're like, oh, we want everybody to have three fatalities. So, you know, we kind of had in mind we're gonna do, it. but then when Rich came up, we we're like, oh, we have to have special moves because he's got the knives. Rich is going to fight with knives. And so we actually tried to, we filmed some stuff of him trying to use weapons in the first game, which didn't work out. But then he came up with like, oh, I got, I have a special move. And then so eventually it was like, oh, you have to come back in and you, in, uh, in the, in the costume and film a special move because it would grow. So that happened, you know, with, with Rich. And then we f- filmed, uh, Carlos. And two, he would come up with something and then we'd be like, oh, we forgot to do, oh, we don't have a reaction for that, for that special move. So we got to film something for that. But each time we were always trying to outdo each other to look better than one another. And two, I was like, oh, I already used that technique. You can't use that technique because then we're going <laughs> to all look the same. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody ha- is, has a unique personality that the, that the actors are, are creating and movement that they are creating, but they have to have special things for themselves. So we were making sure that everyone did everything slightly different. Even the Lin Kuei, if you really look at it, because originally they were brothers, so they kind of have the same fighting style, but the kicks and everything are just a little bit different. That's funny. It reminds me of uh, when they were recording uh, Predator, the movie, like Arnold Schwarzenegger was on set and he would, make fun of everybody else for you know being too weak and things like that so everybody was actually working out in secret in order to kind of put on more weight and ended up being bigger but and they were like running to each other in the gym as one would be leaving like oh yeah you know i'm I'm just walking through but actually they're all secretly trying to outdo each other (laughs) yeah egos Egos. yeah oh yeah definitely (laughs) i didn't even know about that actually (laughs) So you mentioned about how you were all trying to maintain your own separate styles for each of those characters. How did that sort of like, what was that sort of process between the, uh, behind the ideology behind each character? How did that personality sort of evolve through you as actors? Well, from the, uh, like for instance, the Johnny Cage, after the wave, John was like, Oh, that looks cool. Do it again. And this time I was like, you know what? I'm going to be really pompous about this. I'm going to wave, blow some kisses. Flex. <laughs> you know, so we did that a few times and John is just laughing his ass off, you know, and we're just laughing at it. And then finally I was like, wait a minute, I need some sunglasses because I'm going to drink and put on the sunglasses. And do all this. <laughs> do it. So, so then it was from that part that I did that. I was like, from now on, Johnny Cage has to be, over the top charismatic. All the movements he's going to do is are at the end are going to be like the the style he's going to do is more like a charismatic style, you know. So too, Kano was a mercenary, so when he was like, he kind of walk out, kind of rough like, like more like a brawler than a mission. Mm-hmm. So he started to do it, being like, you know, that's where his the whole reason why in the end uh Kano snatches your heart because it's just that that brawler grizzly type of of you know visceral sort of and, yeah yeah instead of doing like a uh being a technician like you know having kung fu you are a technician you're not a brawler but he converted into that whole personality where he's just gruff you know kind of not you know kind of nasty guy type okay. of thing yeah so, so you there's- know, Character. There's no real casting process. It seemed like you guys just kind of fell into your characters is, is what it sounds like. Yeah. We just kind of, yeah, because there was no, John didn't have anything written down mm-hmm. you know, as far as like, Oh, this guy's going to do this or that. No, we were just creating it on the spot, making jokes on the spot, you know, going over, uh, everything was over the top on the spot. Okay. That's, that's actually such an awesome process to even think about just like how it sort of, evolved just through you guys just i guess having fun really yeah yeah uh, uh yeah because again you know when i when we finally started the game i was like john make 201 arcade cabinets 
and give me an arcade cabinet <laughs> and I give you permission to do as many cabinets as you want. Wow. And John is like, no. And I was like, well, I know Ed's the boss, so ask Ed. So we went up to Ed and he's like, Danny wants a cabinet. And Ed's like, no way. They cost like, they're like $5,000. We're not going to give you a cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, yeah, but if you make 201, you can make as many cabinets as you want because this game is going to be really good. And again, probably because of my ego, but, <laughs> you know, be, uh, just because I thought this game was going to kick it. And they're like, no, it's not going to be. We're only making 200 arcade cabinets and you're not getting one. So that being said, I think that we didn't really have any restrictions on anything because nobody was, no, nobody's watching us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, okay, or or, the, or just didn't care like what we were doing, you know. When it first, I re recall when it first tested Johnny Cage versus Johnny Cage, uh, and people were just like, "Oh my god, oh my god, oh!" They were just like, "Oh my god, this is going to be an awesome game." Then we started getting the hype, like people are starting to stop by and watch us work. Like they'd come in and watch me, you know, knew I was in the building, so they'd run by and watch me, like work with the other actors or work you know or do stuff myself you know because it was just not it was really fun because it wasn't just really work because we were all friends we would be teasing each other and through that teasing you, we would get different different move movement different special moves fatalities they're kind of you know they're they're all from the stories that while we were creating it that's cool in addition to johnny cage we've already mentioned that you were pretty much all the ninja, not just Sub-Zero, but also, you know, all the palette swaps, Scorpion, and actually even Reptile, who was the first ever created secret character in a video game, which is quite the, you know, the sort of feat to have, I suppose. Uh, did you know ahead of time, because you did mention the Lin Kuei, did you know ahead of time that you'd be doing sort of palette swaps of these different characters? Or what was the idea there? No, we thought we were going to be able to shoot more characters, but because we were creating the game as we were filming, it took much longer. Mm -hmm. So originally, originally when we were filming uh, the third character, before it really blew up, the fourth character, people from uh, outside of like our acting group, our friendship group started giving ideas. But during the, the Raiden character, uh, Rich and Carlos wanted to have a secret tag team character. Oh. Like only, but only them two, not for anyone else. So if you're <laughs> fighting fighting Kano, you can hit the buttons, and all of a sudden you're fighting Kano and Raiden. Oh, cool! Hey. So they want a secret tag team character. So I, I think at that point, looking back, is when the idea like started being like, oh, secret character, because I was like, oh no, that's not fair. And they were goofing around doing movements to make this up, but and everybody was laughing. But you know. Uh, Things like that were like, oh, now we have an idea of like having a secret, you know, instead of a secret tag team, we can have a secret character. And what happened was when we were going to film, he didn't have a name, uh, the Lin Kuei, we just called everybody Sub-Zero and Scorpion the Lin, Lin Kuei. Okay. Uh, it was only going to be one, the yellow one. And then John was like, we ran out, we're running out of time. You know, we're running, it, it took so long to just create the game, you know, get a basis to create the game. And now that we have like the outline of it and making it run smoother, we can just palette swap. And mm -hmm. my brother and I teased John about, the whole thing was, sometimes I'd go in and I'd see John dressed in the same clothes that I saw him last night, the day before. I mean, I look at him and be like, you're all right. And he's like, and he's like, he, at first he didn't say anything, but I'm like, you, you're all right. Cause you look tired. And he's like, you know what? There's, there's only, I'm the only artist on this game, but there's five programmers on this game. So they think it's funny when the five programmers drop all their work on me and I have to done, have everything done and ready to go to the next step by the oh, next oh. month. So I have to stay overnight. So me, I was like, Hey, I didn't too. I didn't really. Uh, up to this point, uh, you know, Ed would come in for a little bit to kind of advise us on moves and things like that. But he really wasn't there, like the whole filming and creating thing. So I was just like, you want me to go talk to Ed, uh, you know, after work? <laughs> and, and he's like, nah, and he's like, nah. 
But then, but then we're, uh, and then, but Carlos was there and he's just like, nah, John's just being lazy. You know, he just doesn't <laughs> want to go home and shower. He just wants to stay here and do that. And that's when he looked at me and he's like, you know, with this palette swap, I think these ninjas are going to be brothers and they're going to hate each other because one brother is going to kill the father to seize the clan, ruling the clan. So all of a sudden it became like that, just that, that moment of that whole teasing and stuff. And all of a sudden the story had changed into, you know, we weren't sure what the story was, but now they were deadly enemies, you know? So, yeah. So the, the, this goofing around stuff, you know, uh, like Liz, Liz, like when, when, uh, I was like, Oh, John was like, uh, for Liz, who's Sonia, original Sonia. Uh, she was, he was just like, we need, you need to think of a, a, a finishing move because we didn't have fatalities then. We had finishing moves. You got to mm-hmm. finish him. It was, the, was what we came up with. But he's like, you got to think of a finishing move for Liz. And I was like, oh, we got to do that. We got to do the kiss of death. And John is like, dude, we can't, she can't go up to somebody and kiss them. And I started laughing because I'm like, oh, she can, other people can rip your heart out or you can punch your head off or electrify something. But you don't want any, there's no sex in this video. <laughs> so I was like, I was just like, no, not that kid. I was like, just like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, she should kiss her hand and blow it. And it's going to look like a butterfly. And then when it hits you, you blow up. And John was like, oh my God, that's a cool idea. But Liz turned to John and was like, why do I have to kill anybody? I don't want to kill anybody. Why can't I just be their friend? Why can't I just give them a flower instead of killing them? And so. Every, we, we all laughed and kept that joke going for a while, but there, you know, later on in MK2, we have friendships, and we also have somebody who gives somebody else a flower. So yeah. that, all, okay. that is all yeah. Fun. yeah. So that type of those type of things would be t- going on like all the time. And it's funny you mentioned the like in the conversation of secret characters. You also mentioned tag team. Now, initially, we did have the sort of I guess you could call them the initial sort of phase of tag team which was really the endurance sort of matches but tag team sort of was brought into mortal kombat through noob cybot and smoke who you technically did portray as well what was the idea behind bringing them into the game well during number one john was just like hey if we wind up with more time we can do more palette swap Lin Kuei, can you create instead of doing two characters create four do movement so we can have four people who look kind of the same because they're all, you know, all from the same family. Again, the story didn't grow to where one is mocking the other one or anything like that, which is the original creation. So he's like, create four more. And if we get time, we'll have them. We'll, we'll be able to do them. Hmm. So during number two, that was also that that thing when I'm filming the, the, the Lin Kuei and and he was just like, hey, if we have more time, because, again, we wanted even more characters in number two, and we added some, but we did, uh, like, John wanted two different female characters for number two. You know, not the palette swapping because that we did. Besides the palette swapping, he wanted a different, try to get somebody else in there to have other characters. So, but that was our basic, to add characters, this was the easiest way if I would just create, you know, and they would look at it and add names to them and then be like, okay, then we're going to add backstories to whatever. So it became like the pattern to be like, yeah. okay, well, you know, you, you can create, you know, you're a martial art, m- martial artist. You can create, you know, and you know what we're doing or, you know, you kind of basically I'll create it. So I'll say, I'm, that's why I always say I'm co-creator, but a lot of people are like, oh, you're not co-creator. It, it, two, you know, during that time, there was nothing, there was no uh, character design or anything mm-hmm. like that. There was no titles like that. It was just whoever created it, created it. So that, so I kind of old school and be like, oh, yeah, I co-created because a lot of like ideas or just concepts or even things that I came up with. I, I see them active in, in what they're doing today in the motion capture today. I'm like, oh, I made that up. Or yeah. I, that, we got over the hump. I remember me goofing. And too, it's the stories that really kind of get me going because I'm like, it, it, I remember the goofing around to get to different places you know, different stories. So the go-to was to have, you know, Pacina make up more than Quay and we could palette swap. You know, it's, it's cool to me that you talked about Raiden and Kano, the idea of them being the original uh, tag team, because 
the Malibu comics ended up making like a Raiden and Kano comic book with just the two of them. And I was I was always thought that was the weirdest storyline for a comic book to dive into. It's like, why would you want to team these two up for a comic? But like hearing that that kind of idea was there from the beginning, even with you guys, consider something like that. That's just cool to me. <laughs> yeah, like little little things that happen, you know, were that were you know, uh, going on, like, one time when Rich was filming, he started to dance. And then when Carlos saw that, dressed as Raiden, he started to dance. He started to dance. So all of a sudden we have Rich dancing and then Carlos dancing. And then when I got to film something, I did a little dance. And then and then when Hosung got to do his filming, he heard about that and saw that. And so he did a little <laughs> in the end, you know, in Mortal Kombat 2, you see Hosung doing a little dance. But yeah. that's, that's how it kind of started, you know, like goofing around as characters. Like, what if, you know, what if Kano you know, could break dance, you know, and what if Rado, uh, uh, Raiden can uh, pop lock, you know, and things like, you know, <laughs> just goofiness. Like all of a sudden, just those little jokes come out later on. It, it's pretty funny. So when you guys were filming Mortal Kombat 1 especially, but even in Mortal Kombat 2, I mean, you, you didn't have the highest budget in the world. What did you think about the various costumes that were getting put into place uh, for, for all the characters? Well, uh, for the first game, most of the costumes were our own. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a budget. And John was just like, hey, where, you know, first thing when I was filming Johnny Cage, I just wore the black spandex because that's the 90s you know, 80, late 80s, 90s, and that's what you wear. And then he was like, next time you come in, bring a sash because they're the color. You don't have mm -hmm. the color to separate the waist. You know, so I just was like, okay, well, if I wear a black sash, it'll be, you won't be able to see that. I have to wear something, you know, that defines the waist. So I bought in a red sash. So now Johnny Cage has that, that look. You know, same thing with Liz, you know, she's an aerobic stuck instructor. She's got an aerobic outfit you know rich went to a surplus store with john to buy the most of the uh kano outfit i went with john to the martial arts store to buy uh we picked out a taekwondo uniform on top because it just had a different look than kano's cross japanese traditional uniform to give the character a complete different look and carlos added from his own from break scene he used to use these band-aids around his legs so that way he wouldn't trip over his pants when he's breakdancing, doing crazy legs. So now he put those on the bottom of Raiden's uniform. So when you look at MK1, you see how his legging is tapered on the bottom. Yeah. And those are bandages used when Carlos used to breakdance that he added to his costume. So during number one, there was a lot of we would just be able to kind of improvise on the costume. But number two. Uh, they spent some money on it. They spent some money on on uh, you know we got a uh, we got a digital camera. I think that's the reason why there's really no behind the scenes footage from number two is because the first one was uh, high eight, and two before it was done, John gave me those tapes. He's like, hey, thank. You. He's like, not only am am I going to put you on the side of the the game as a thank you, you know, for helping me create my dream. Uh, here's all the tapes. Make a copy of them. He goes, you, you could tell people this is what you create and try to get me jobs for it. You know, just during the, uh, when they sold the right, started selling the rights, all that stuff kind of disappeared where like, oh yeah, you don't have the right to do that stuff anymore. Because, <laughs> you know, now it's, now it's about money. Right, right. You know? <laughs> well, what were some of the challenges you faced when playing your roles? Did you suffer any injuries throughout filming or anything like that? Uh, a lot of, two different examples like that are I really think define everything is when Johnny Cage was supposed to like I it took us like man five hours to decide on sweeps because he wanted to throw he wanted a leg sweep so I started doing a leg sweep and I'm looking at him like doing a judo leg sweep and I'm like dude that is boring you know <laughs> and so I started goofing around with that and eventually I have like the lower drop your body and leg sweep all the way around thing i just i was like now that is really cool because we can 
too, when we're filming it, head is low enough where it won't affect the hitboxes or things like that. So, you know, you start to, to think uh, with the project. But when we were, the reaction, sometimes you get hit with it, and which was a totally different other falling down for like three hours is, to, is a different story, trying to create how they fall. But I would jump up over the legs where it's a miss. And then John is like, you're jumping too high because when you jump high, your head shades on the top. And so now we don't have a proper image. It's, you know, it, this part is darker. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to jump, you know, jump a little lower. And so I was like, okay, so I'm jumping lower. And he's like, yeah, but jump lower and pick your legs up. And I look at him and I'm like, <laughs> I look at him. So I tried it a few times and he's like, that, uh, this is good, but hold up your legs longer. And then I look at him and I was like, <laughs> I can't float, dude. <laughs> I can't float. And he starts laughing. He starts laughing and we're laughing because we're tired at that point too. It's like, you know, you get tired of doing this. You know, him and I being stuck in this room for like eight, 10 hours, you know, you know, nobody coming in at this point or anything like that. You know, we, you know, Red Ed would rarely come in unless we, we needed his help with something in particular. Um, but, you know, I looked across and I saw a staircase and I was like, can I use that staircase? And John was just like, hey, it would be easier to use a chair. And I was like, yeah, but John, if I sit in the chair, it will look like I'm sitting in a chair. Because you kind of sit and you can tell that somebody's sitting. But with the staircase, we can use that at different angles to kind of balance yourself and make it look like you're jumping. Because if you're the way if you're balancing on the edge of the staircase, you can prop your legs over this way. So I explained to him how we can use the staircase to basically cheat the jump. And that way uh, my head would be the thing. So he's like, let's try it. We tried the staircase. And this is one of the things, even today in in Mortal Kombat. In the background, I see a staircase and I just start laughing. I was like, oh, my God, because I came up with that. I was like, that's one of the things, hurdles that we we came up with to try to get over that. That was one of the uh, filming hurdles. So the day before we're going to film uh, the Lin Kuei, Tony Marquez is going to be the Kung Lao is going to be that guy. But he drops a 25 pound weight on his toe and breaks his toe. Oh. Now, because all the kicks... I have to be slow to get clean images. He can't keep his balance on his foot because oh. it's broken. It was broken. So I had to, John is like, you got to step in and do it. But the whole joke was before Tony came in, we were in this, John and I are in this store looking at uniforms for this, to create this Lin Kuei uniform because it's different than the Japanese ninjutsu uniform. You know, because I really wanted it to be different, you know, not the mainstream, because back then everything is Japanese ninjas. Hmm. So I was just like, we were looking at the things and then John looks at this and he's like, hey, what's the difference between uh, uh, an adult small and a child extra large? And I look at it. I didn't open the package. I look at it. I was like, the price. <laughs> <laughs> we should just get the cheaper one. And don't worry, Tony Tony has to just fit into it and he can't complain. Tony won't complain. <laughs> so as a joke, we bought that, but then I wound up wearing that. Oh my god. <laughs> so I threw a kick. I'm I'm 20 pounds at that time. I, even I was like 20 pounds heavier than Tony, different weight class, everything. So I threw a click uh kick and I ripped the crotch. <laughs> So it has to be black because there's no Photoshop back then. And if you see white, that means John's going to spend three or four hours trying to shade in the, the, the skin color to make it black, it, as, a, as well as cut out each frame. So, you know, without Photoshop, there's lots of time to be, you know, worked on stuff. So I was like, we can, we'll pin it. Got any safety pins? No, no safety pins. We only have the pins that you put into chalk uh, cock boards. So <laughs> I threaded those in here. So sometimes when I was kicking, I would be getting pin tricked by the pin oh <laughs> in the thighs and things like that. So there were, that was an uncomfortable hurdle. I'm Another uncomfortable one thinking is, about it. <laughs> <laughs> originally when we're trying to figure out all the falls and jumps, there's no mat. So I'm doing flips onto my back, onto my front, 
looking, filming different ways to fall on concrete. And at the end of the day, I'm like all beat up and I'm like, John, the, the rest of the crew is not going to want to fall on concrete. You know, people are not going to want to do this. No, no, you know, no matter how much glory is in this thing, they're not going to want to do it. We got to get gnats to, to, you know, kind of protect people. And he's like, yeah, he was like, we have mats. I just need to dig them out, find out where they are and take them out and stuff like that and make sure everybody has a mat. So the first falls, different falls, you know, right now we cut it down to basically like three or four falls and, and the rolling and things like that. We did all that experimentation, four or five hours falling on concrete. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. You mentioned ripping your, your crotch. Now, was that the inspiration for the nut punch with Johnny or <laughs> where did that come from? No, that was the actual when when John eventually we were like, oh, we got to make fun of Van Damme, and I was like, no, nah, I'm, I'm I I I pay for Van Damme movies, so I am a fan, <laughs> fan of Van Damme, but I will not do Van Damme because I know like Van Damme is not like a, a, a proper martial artist. He's a mm -hmm. dancer. A dancer, you know, yeah. I think he's got a blue belt and, or a green belt and, and some karate style or taekwondo style, which is basically eight months training, which is basically nothing, you know. Uh, in traditional martial arts, eight years is where you got have all your basics. Now you can learn the good stuff. Mm -hmm. so, and it, that's true in anything. If you're a guitar player, there's no way you could play for eight months and go join a rock band. There, no, you don't know enough. You don't have that skill. Or a professional mm -hmm. golfer. No, you don't golf for eight months and think like, oh, now I could go to professional golf. No, it's a skill. It takes time. Eight years is a probably all around time for anything that has that skill or learning, you know. Mm -hmm. or, so with this stuff it, it 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 was just kind of you know getting pricked you know you got to make the adjustments you got to too we got we have to get this project really done so you know we're a lot of times you know we glued kano's mask on his face because <laughs> he sweats a lot and we tried spirit glue gum on his face and it would just fall off so eventually <laughs> we took model glue and we oh it on his face. <laughs> and when when we put it tore it off, it tore off skin. Oh my god. You know, but Rich, <laughs> like, no, we got we have to get this project done and this is this is things that are gonna happen. Because too, it wasn't for money. We weren't gonna pay a lot, but we were able we were that was the agreement. We could create this game with them. You know, that's what we agreed on. Yeah, any ideas we had that we would make them work. And, and when you give that to somebody, all of a sudden they're doing things like above and beyond things, you know, gluing things on your face, getting pricked by pins, you know, uh, just, you know, putting a sweaty, uh, you know, for, for Baraka, that thing had no air vents in it. When he put it over his head, it's, it's like having plastic on your head. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of it was just a lot of sacrifice, but it was fun. There were jokes all through the whole thing. I I love how you guys basically embody your characters. I could see Rich getting his mask ripped off and just kind of grunting and <laughs> <at> everybody. <laughs> yeah, he would walk around with that, you know, with that. Uh, like when he was, when he had anything Kano on, he was Kano. He'd mm -hmm. walk around like Kano. That's that whole thing with, you know, what, what you hear of, like, get over here. When I, you know, in the morning we had a meeting, uh, you know, John was just like, hey, Ed wants to come up with a move. And I was like, what do you want? Uh, what, uh, and at this point I was like, well, what, what's his move? Well, can we make it work? And he was like, hey, I want a lasso. I want to tie you up. And then when you're tied up, you get a free hit. And then I was like, well, that's kind of Wonder Woman-ish. You know, there's a rope dart. And I explained it to them and stuff like that. And and kind of like they're they're looking at me because I was like, too lazy to go to my back to actually get a rope dart out because I had one and show them what it was. You know, then later on in the day, it kind of hit, it, it kind of hit Ed where he's just like, Oh, there's, there's a way you can do this stuff. And then we are just like, well, yeah, that's what we're talking about. You know, how, how we're, how it escalates, but sometimes, you know, you need that process to, to absorb what is going. But when I was doing the rope dart, while I was doing the rope dart and pulling him because it's used as a weapon with, that's actually like a spearhead more than a knife because a knife is designed to go in and out while a spearhead is designed to go in and as it comes out, pull you or rip you, you know, just by the diamond shape. 
So this was used to pull horsemen off their horses. But as I was doing that, Rich yelled out in the cano voice, get over here. And man, we just laughed so much. Ed walked around the whole day saying, get over here, get <laughs> over here, like Kano, because it was done. It was just hilarious. But things like that, you know, goofing around, then they wind up in the game. Wow. That's quite like me to know about how the actual get over here came up, came up in that sense. So speaking of Scorpion, then I have to ask, you've mentioned that Johnny Cage is your favorite, but of the ninja that you portrayed, who was your favorite? I like the story behind Sub Zero more when we were creating than Scorpion. Scorpion, it was it, uh, you know it, and I think that that's kind of just how it rolled, having a color swap, because otherwise that story would kind of be boring for him to be, you know, even though it's cool to be Lin Kuei, you know, it would wear out well the first game, but we and two we didn't know there was going to be a second game. But, you know, as as far as story, that ended there. But later on, how it developed, I like that, you know, Sub-Zero was actually, you know, in the early days was the good, good the good Lin Kuei. You know, Scorpion was the bad guy. So, you know, I, I like uh, Sub-Zero more just because of that story. So in 95, Mortal Kombat 3 came out. And at this point, they decided to kill off Johnny Cage, which, I mean, that's your iconic role i mean you're on the side of the cabinet and everything do you want to kind of talk about the events that led up to this yeah yeah and you know and again it's uh it's it's the typical uh entertainment business story you know mm-hmm. having the creator batman having the creator superman having to stan lee for a while having to everybody so you know when uh when uh when they pre-ordered when mortal kombat was a success testing and they pre-ordered 10,000 games, I asked John and Ed, hey, you guys told me there's only going to be 200 games, and now you're pre-ordering 10,000. And I told you, if you would have gave me a game, you would have created all you can, all you wanted, but you didn't. You know, we helped create this thing. We need, we need a bonus. You know, and so John was just like, John and Ed were just like, oh, don't worry, we're going to give all you guys a bonus. You know, everybody's going to get a bonus because everybody is going to, every, this is successful. These guys mm-hmm. are not jerks. You know, use the word asshole. But <laughs> they're not you're going to get a bonus. So then it went to the home system. I'm like, hey, you told me it's going to be uh arcade game. Now it's going to home. They're like, don't worry. We're going to give you a bonus for that too. So coming from... I filmed for three months before I got paid. I filmed for two months without signing uh, uh, a contract for for the rights to make the game, just because we didn't do it. We were friends and kind of just. Eventually, John was like, "Hey, you didn't, you didn't, you know, sign the disclaimer." And I was like, "I didn't know there was a disclaimer." He goes, "That's why you haven't got paid. You didn't sign for this, so they don't even know. They don't even know how to, who to pay." So you got to sign this and get paid. So Rich, who was the second character, got paid before I got paid. So I waited like three months to get my first check from the creation of Mortal Kombat, from 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 when I actually started at uh, working for them, not when I was pitching the game because then I wasn't, you know, under contract for anything. We we're just pitching this game. But so eventually, during number two, I was like, guys. You know, you guys got a bonus already. I know you got a bonus already because you guys are, you know, I, I was thinking to myself, you guys are driving new cars. You got new stuff. We didn't, we didn't get our bonus yet. And I was like, hey, John, we didn't get our bonus. And then he's like, uh, talk to Ed. And I went to Ed. Ed, we didn't get our bonus. And he's like, uh, let me ask management. So the manager comes up to me, the owner, one of the owners, not the owner, but one of the uh, head guys comes up to me. He's like, do you have any of what John and Ed promised you in writing? And I was like, oh, these guys have already talked about this. You know, because I, you didn't, you know, you don't say that direct, just walk up to somebody and say that without knowing what's in the loop. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, they gave me their word. And he's just like, then, I, then we can't help you. And then I stopped. So for me, when they, uh, Mortal Kombat 3 didn't have Johnny Cage, didn't have Sub-Zero, didn't have Scorpion, their most popular characters. I think they just tried to 
you know, it wasn't until what was, there was three threes, right? Or two threes. There was a three. Three threes. There was a, a trilogy or a, or, a, or a, an ultimate. And then three there was ultimate something. trilogy. Yeah. Yeah. So there were yeah. three, three, there were three threes, but the first three didn't have any of the, the, you know, any of the real iconic characters. There was no, there was no uh, Liu Kang for the, for the number, uh, the third one until later. Right. Um, Liu Kang. I don't remember. I think he might've been in three, but I, I think he might have been a different actor. Yeah, he was a different mm. actor, but I think they brought him in later too. Maybe. Because everybody who was like everybody who sided with me at that point left the game, and we're like, "Hey, you know, that's not right." They, they promised us that we would be, you know, we helped create it. Mm. You know, uh, Carlos and Rich stayed on to work because they were into the computer graphics, into that. They wanted to be in that industry, so they stayed behind it and kind mm. of joined the joined with uh, helping that industry out. But two, I just kind of was like, okay, I'm I'm done, and I left, and uh, you know, tried to get a lawsuit going. Uh, uh, Ho Sung also did a lawsuit from California and won, while I did a lawsuit from Illinois and lost. Oh wow! So I, I didn't realize there were two different ones. Yeah, I honestly yeah. thought it was like a class action, all of you together. But uh, no, we, uh, the people who the myself, Catalin, Liz, and Philip did ours in Illinois, and we lost. Well, Ho Sung got somebody from California to do it, and he won. They settled with him for a lot of money. So because the one with uh, with yourself and and the rest of the staff that was all the same lawsuit because there's a couple different sources that say there were two different those there, those two were two different ones. Uh, yeah, well, there was me and Liz on one side, on one mm-hmm. side, and then there was Philip and Catalin had their own, but we were all from Chicago. Gotcha. We filed yeah. Chicago and lost. Osung fi- filed from California and won, which is kind of really weird if you're looking at the entertainment, yeah. how one person, you know, can do that. You know, later on, there are a bunch of stories, you know, uh, uh, eventually that came out just because a lot of things come out in time about, you know, what, how uh, politics maybe in Chicago play off, you know, different than California where it's not really, you know, where yeah. you don't have space. So. So with that, that that's you know, and and I walked away from Mortal Kombat for a really long time. Um, w- so somewhere in between all of this, you ended up being involved in the very famous ad for the uh, video game Bloodstorm, where you wore your full Johnny Cage outfit and were playing uh, the Bloodstorm video game and basically endorsing it as as better than Mortal Kombat. What where does where does that fall in line with all of this? Well, before this, before the falling out, during one of the things, you know, uh, just looking back at it, uh, so originally, one of the guys who helped with Mortal Kombat 2, Alan Noon, got a new job at, I think, Estrada, who came out with Bloodstorm. I think so, so yeah. Yeah, so he contacted Tobias uh, and was like, hey, you think, that, you know, we can have Pacina, you know, do like an ad and then... You know, John called me up and said, hey, they, they want to do an ad with you as Johnny Cage, but you can't really be Johnny Cage, but you are Johnny Cage. <laughs> so make some money, but we got to be careful. So I went to Ed and Ed advised me on what I can wear and what I couldn't wear to be to do this ad. So basically, I can wear stuff that I owned because it's mine. It's not really theirs to, you know, they can't own what I what I rightfully own. Yeah. You can't be like, oh, I own that. Well, did you buy that for me? No, it's been, you know, so I did that. And so uh, through that, uh, the, the head was, uh, and I forget Leaf's name. He was pretty good because he paid a lot. Head was like, <laughs> man, charge, charge them a lot because in the end, they can, oh, they'll negotiate with you. It's too much, they'll negotiate. And uh, lessons from Ed Boone. He was just like, and if they say yes right away, you know that you undercut yourself next time you add more. And I was like, oh, okay. So I gave them a price uh, and they scarfed it up right away. So I know I got <laughs> But for me, it was a big, for an hour's work, it, it was a lot of money for me at that time. It was a lot of money. It was more than hour, the hourly that a claim paid us, which, which again, I, I kind of threw out a really high number thinking that they would do that before. They they took it right away too, but uh, so you know. So, but it was just life life lessons. So you know they we have our you know I, our our contacts through that. I know somebody re- recently uh, reached out to Alan to, 
to try to get him to uh, do an interview on that subject, and he said he would not do it, that he won't do anything that uh, interviews uh, involving Bloodstorm and MK. So he's like, if you want to do it on something else, he goes, I can talk about it. He goes, but I can't talk about that, period. So what's the relationship like now between you and other Realm Studios or any specific individuals, like obviously Ed Boone or John Tobias? Has there been any contact? Is there any from communication was, between you? There was for, for a while. There was for a while. And then, uh, you know, uh, and again, this is my opinion and how I see things. You know, so eventually, uh, you know, I would talk to John every once in a while when there was a combat con or an event, we would get together, have dinner or, you know, eat together, hang out together, have a couple of drinks together. But eventually, uh, and a uh, third party started, uh, tweeting for him on Twitter. Mm, okay. And so I sent a message out to, to John. So did, uh, so did a few of us saying, Hey, this guy is saying all this stuff. You know, we know it's not you. And, uh, you know, basically we were told that, yeah, the person doing it is overzealous and wants to be protective, you know, of, of John Tobias, the creator, you know, there's a lot of John Tobias's out there. So the actual creator, uh, wants to be protective of him. And so he's kind of overzealous and, you know, Rich is like, he's disrespectful, you know, and, and things like that. So, and I was like, well, you know what, you can't, uh, and I told Rich, the only way to rightfully debate this stuff about all this stuff that we're just chatting about is face to face will only be the only way that you can solve it. You know, doing it through through a tweet, you don't really know who you're talking to. Mm. You know, you have people who want to add stuff like that. Politicians use that all the all the time. Oh, my staff tweeted that, so I'm I'm gonna fire them, but I'm gonna stay in office. Mm -hmm. Because that is the buffer for that. You know, you're on Twitter and you're popular, that's the best buffer. Mm -hmm. To be like, oh, somebody else did it. You know, that way, if it ever bites you in the butt. No, no, I didn't do that. You know, my writing agent did it or somebody else can take the blunt. So, yeah. you know, for uh, when that started happening and I saw that there quite couldn't be like one like that, I was just stopped, you know, calling or hanging out or, or wanting to hang out with Tobias, you know. And as far as Ed, I, man, I kind of even am today a little bit bitter because Ed was the boss and I felt like Ed never protected us. Mm. Ed knows, you know, Ed knows that I helped John pitch the game to him, mm -hmm. you know, and I know he's a creator, but he's not the, like the cre conceptual creator. He's more of like uh, the the lead programmer and franchise creator. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's different yeah. than my concept. So with, with Ed, I don't really talk to because I still kind of like mad, like, guess what? You know, and I, too, I understand that John and Ed can't come out and say, verify anything I say. You know, because then they'd be like, oh, you guys knew all this. And then you let Midway sell the rights to Warner Brother. You're never working this industry again. And two, you owe us, you know, half a billion dollars. You know, if they, if they ever came out and said, yeah, that, you know, you know. So I don't really talk to them. But uh, the other cast members, you know, from one and two, we hang out like as much as we can or call each other. You know, Rich almost calls me every other day. Tony calls me five times a week. You know, I still talk to my brother because he's my brother. My mom would kick our ass if we didn't talk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, too, on, th on that note, we are coming out with a documentary from all the people from one and two who will just tell their stories and tell, you know, kind of what happened with, uh, with that era, you know. And so you will hear all these stories, too, from other, other people. So it's not like I'm the only only one that's telling these stories these, uh, these other people will be coming out and saying like yeah this happened this adding their own stories but also kind of verifying what what i'm saying but more enough kind of more of a friendly matter manner because the documentary is about our friendship mm, okay. you know more about our friendship most of us started before mk and and even our time with mk was awesome we still continue you know mm -hmm. we still hang out with each other we still tease each other we still you know move around with each other so yeah. it's, it's it's a shame honestly i mean to see that sort of bad blood but at the same time it's nice to see that that appreciation for that time together too yeah and again i understand i understand it's like more than you know it's it's not that i like it but i understand how it how it is and where it has gone you know you can't really 
you know, you can't ruin your life over trying to, you know, you know, make something right. Usually, you know, this type of thing, you make it right on your deathbed. You know, before you die, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm the one who hijacked the plane, you know, and then you got that and then you die. So this, too, is kind of like that. I don't expect like John and Ed to be like, oh, yeah, what he said is 100 percent true. But in my defense, with this documentary coming out, you're going to hear everybody else saying the same thing. So it's going to be more, you know, it's going to be more like a little not only believable, but you can hear uh, different versions of the story in different different ways or adding and subtracting or goofing around. You know, because there's when we were making, we were always goofing around. When is this documentary supposed to come out? We shot, uh, we shot at C2E2, we shot a teaser trailer. Oh, cool. So they're putting that together right now. Just this awesome. last day. The team came out, uh, you know, the three documentary team, and we had two extra cameramen come out and just, uh, the mic was on us all the time. So you're going to hear us bantering, you know, goofing around. <laughs> Like uh, we're uh, a lot of us are like old married couples, <laughs> a long time. So we'll like argue and bicker at each other because we kind of like, oh, he always does that. Oh, you know, don't do that. Oh, come on, you know, do that or just you know, or, or be like, or be like, hey, you know, uh, you know what friends do together. Is there a name and, for the documentary? Uh, I don't think they have a name yet. They're better at the name than I am. <laughs> I just put the. I just reached out to everybody from everyone from one and two, you know, and so far everybody from one and two has agreed to, to do it. So awesome. you know, uh, the only one I didn't re- really reach out to was uh, uh, Brian Glenn. He was in two, but he was, they filmed him after I left, you know, okay. so, and two, he was hired through the, uh, outside of the, uh, you know, through an outside source, but, you know, we'll have everybody else, you know, uh, you know, the original, Original Liu Kang, original Kano, you know, original Sonya. The original cast, full stop. Yeah, yeah the original, the original, original cast. Yeah. Because it's really popular right now to be like, oh, I'm the original actor from this, from this series. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well that's cool if you realize that actor is the key thing, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you're the original number two or three or four or five or 12. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's cool that they do that, but sometimes it's kind of like when you look at them, you're kind of like craziness. You're like, um, "What's that? You know, you're the original fifth. <laughs> it's cool that you and the the rest of the cast. I mean, from from both games, end up doing so much together. Like you guys make appearances together. Um, you've even been in movies like Book of Swords. There was a whole bunch of you together that kind of participated in that. Uh, Ho Sung Park, Catelyn, uh, Richard Divizio. Um, and then you guys also did uh, another video game that never got released, one for the Atari, the, the Realm Fighters. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, that game with Catlin on a previous episode. Can you tell us anything about it? Uh, because, I mean, it's something that I think a lot of people would have wanted to have seen because there were so many of you guys involved in that. Yeah, actually, I joined because it was for Hosung. Hosung wanted to get into making video games. He oh, realized, cool. Yeah, he, he realized, like, you know, after doing MK and watching everything, he's like, man, those guys made a lot of money. Uh, and and it, it's something cool to work work on. And, you know, and being from one, on the ground floor creating it, he got a good uh, eye for how to create it. You know, seeing our interaction, you know, not only with with doing the basic movements, but our interaction was with the, with the programmer, you know, direct interaction with pro, the program and, and the artist and, and things like that. So it wasn't just like, Oh, you do your job and that's it. You're like, hey, you know, you're learning about, you know, not that you're mastering everything, but you get a good idea of, of, of you know, what goes on in making of a game. And so Hosung tried his hand at that. And that was a Hosung project. He was like, hey, will you help me do this game? He goes, and he goes, but I'll make sure you get a contract and, you know, me, you'll get paid. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, and it's Hosung. So I was like, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, I'll do, I'll do it because I knew, you know, it's, you know, some, if your friend is not directly in charge, it's hard for them to protect you. you know, mm, yeah. As far as like John, I know he wasn't directly in charge and there is not that much he can do being 22 and, you know, how are you going to defend your, your friends when you work for a company, when they probably are saying, hey, you shouldn't have done this, but, you know, not, but not acknowledging, yeah, but you told me there was only going to be 200 games. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, him letting us have free reigns to 
create the game was probably difficult for him. Uh, but with Hosang, he was like, don't worry. He goes, we, he goes, we're, we are a team because we were, you know, back, back then, even now I talk to him, not, not as often as, as like the other guys, but at least, you know, every other month I'm in mm. contact with Hosang. You know, he's in, uh, so there's, there's, that friendship is still there, you know, mm-hmm. all, the, all the way around with everyone. So him being the lead for that game, uh, yeah, we just, we filmed some, not everything, but we filmed, I think, enough for uh, somebody to play like the first couple levels. I think I, I'm saying that because someone let, sent me a link where you can play the first couple levels as like a sample or something like that. Oh, wow. I, is it like something that's floating around on the internet or was it just somebody yeah. that was involved? Yeah, oh. uh, I would say it's on the internet because the guy Ooh. sent me the link. He's like, hey, are you the Daniel Pacina from Theo Rum Fighter? Oh, um, wow. Yeah, I was like, uh, yeah. He was like, do you know that this is out there? And he sent me a link and it's like in you know, the first two levels or something like that. I was like, I did not know that this was even. <laughs> we're we're going to have to find this. Yeah, yeah. We have to send it yeah. over to us. <laughs> yeah, I'll put a look at that. I, it was when I used to be on Twitter a lot more. Uh, but man, social media, man. You, you know, what this pandemic has taught me is there's a lot more respect for the little guys. You know, you guys doing this podcast, you know, uh, during, you know, these these times, like all the little guys really were the people who kept everybody sane. <laughs> you know, you're watching TV, sure, but you're jumping on the Internet, watching podcasts, learning about stuff. You know, you know what I mean? A lot of people mm-hmm. who are trapped at home really, you know, because at work. You can't really watch a podcast without getting busted. But but when you're working from home, you could have it playing in the corner and learning stuff and hearing different entertainment things. You know, so it really has taught me like the, the value of like just doing this, the little guy doing all this stuff, creating all these content, you know, to fill in that that gap, that creative gap. So yeah, the yeah. entertainment industry kind of flipped on its head during this time. So it's it's been interesting to see like even your appearances and stuff. I mean, it it went from like giant conventions to even smaller conventions. I've noticed because just the the amount of people that are allowed into spaces and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Until you you kind of uh, recognize the skill. You know, I tried it. I was on uh, I was on what is it? Uh, Twitch, with the video p- uh, platform. Yeah. I was teaching on. You know, and then I realized, guess what? Got to have a good camera. I got the good camera. My lighting sucks. Oh, I got to invest in lighting. I, I I invested in four sets of light. Oh, I need four more. Eight <laughs> sets of light. Oh, they can't really hear me. My microphone sucks. Get a new microphone. Oh, that one sucks. Get another one. That one sucks. Oh, finally get like one that you know. Do the research. Get the one. Get a get a Yeti, uh, <laughs> and a microphone. And now now I now I'm rocking and rolling. Oh crap! I can't read the lettering. I need to get a 50 inch TV. <laughs> <laughs> Things are scrolling on the on the thing. Oh my god! I need this. I need that. Dude, doing a freaking podcast is expensive and a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, and you don't, you know, sure you could realize it if somebody points it out, but when you don't, re- if nobody points it out and then you try to jump in and realize, like, oh, crap, oh, crap, you know, uh, one hurdle, another hurdle, you know, this, that, you know, and it's it's a lot of work, man. <laughs> I'm glad I'm I'm happy I'm on this end again. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your opinion on the original games, looking back on them now? Like, do you ever play them once in a while or have you tried any of the more recent games or do you prefer to love the series in other ways? I played a little bit, but they're fighter games, so uh, they never fight like, like I think they would and to maybe my ego. Too, and I'm like, I'd never lose. Like for me, I would be like, I never. Shansung would never beat me. <laughs> uh, guess what? Let there be a tag team with Kano and Raiden because both of them could not beat me. <laughs> that, that is my. That is my. That is me. That is my ego being like that. So I like first person shooters, but for me, again, it, it, the games, it, all the games, the movies. When I see the movies, I really enjoy them because I'm not looking at, I'm not super critical about the action or anything like that. Uh, all When they're doing their stuff, it reminds me of the stories and just start laughing and remember my friends. You know what I mean? That's Sub-Zero cool. Ice Ball. You know, I see Sub-Zero Ice Ball. Oh, man, I start laughing. 
you know, with the first movie, they have a couple frames where I was looking at, you know, when I, when I first saw it, I looked at the framing and I'm like, wait a minute, that looks familiar. So I thumbed through my pictures, you know, because we gave two uh, pictures to Kazanoff, the producer of it. Mm -hmm. And then I see a picture of Liu Kang and Sun Zero in the same exact pose as we did during the game. And I'm like, oh my God, they just took what, they took exactly what we created and they did this and they, and this, and then I'm like, then I'm watching the, then that makes me watch the movie again to be like, oh, that's, they got that from our picture. They got that from our picture. Oh, they got that from our picture. You know what I mean? So I just, now I just laugh because it's just not laugh at them, but it brings me joy to really see that the franchise is doing well and that two other actors are, are doing, you know, doing things that I'm like, oh my God, we created that. You know what I mean? They can never, that's too why the OG is kind of difficult because OG usually means he had something to do with the creation or something like that. So unless, you know, unless you're, you know, creating like, you know, Liz really wanted the, the leg throw. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so every time you see Sonya doing the leg throw, even in movies today or in games today, that's Liz. You're there, you, you know, that is a, she wanted that in the game and that is in the game. That's so cool. And, and two, the way we did it was like, you know, I got kicked in the face <laughs> a couple times because they wanted to catch her as her body is leaning back in a clear image. Mm. So I would crouch to the side and when she's going over, I would try to rush up and grab the very tips of her shoes because you, you can't grab the whole shoe because then John is coloring in your flesh and the white. <laughs> Now that's more of a thing. So I'm trying to grab it in a way where I, I'm as little obtrusive as I can be, you know, holding her legs up. So the first time it came over, it freaking hit me in the eye. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So I'm trying to like this and freaking scrape my ear. You know, so so when I see the leg throw, it's totally different than how other people see it. Mm -hmm. I yeah. start, you I see a boot to the face. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, like, oh, I don't remember getting kicked in the face with that. Or, or I remember it rubbed my ear in such a way that it really oh. freaking bothered me for two or three days. You know what I mean? Where it's all, it was all raw in here. So, you know, when you see stuff like that and associate with stuff like that, you know, it's cool that all the other people are doing it. That's awesome. But for for me, I see everything like kind of in a, in a, in a different light. Yeah. Uh, you know, remembering like, oh, man, I remember, you know, th this guy made that up or this person made this up or, oh, you know, how this is, you know, this happened. So, yeah, I, I like all those. You can see that what you were saying about sort of holding Sonia's leg grab for a second, even in the games, I, I remember, like, I visually remember just how it like kind of pauses there for a second and then she flips you back. So I, I see exactly what you're saying. Although I'm also curious now because you've mentioned the ice bowl. How did the ice bowl come about? For Sub Zero, the ice ball was we. John and Ed were bickering a little bit about having like the ice ball, like a, having an ice thing, uh, ice thing happening, and uh, I was just like, you know, when they were like, "Oh, you got to shoot ice," I was just like, "Man, shoot ice! That's like a okay. How would you do that? Well, you'd have to take, you know." Uh, You'd have to take moisture out of the air. So I would go like this. You have to shape it. And then you'd have to shoot it out. Mm -hmm. So when I when they were saying like, oh, throw ice, it wasn't just like stick your hat and throw ice. I had a, like a process. Like, how do you make that real? Because we're making like a real fake fighting game. You know, it's real to <laughs> real some <fake>. extent. But, <laughs> but, you know, I don't I, I, I'm not keen on the guy just sticks his hand out and you know, and something comes out of his hand. Yeah. In the original Mortal Kombat 1, it, it seemed like he was throwing it uh, kind of from his chest, if I remember. Yeah, it was right. doing yeah. that or something. Yeah, yeah because it? he brings it down like uh -huh. this. Okay. He yeah, it was like moisture down into his, into his uh, dantian and his lung, because the lung can hold the moisture, and then okay. your energy comes from your middle thing, and then you shape it, you know, so it's like this, and then you throw it out. So it, there... So even when I see other people doing this or that, I kind of, re I'm like, oh yeah, that was really fun to create that, you know? So when I see it in movies or in Mortal Kombat, other people doing it in the games, it's always kind of like, I'm kind of like, yeah, that's, I remember that, how that happened. You know, that's kind of cool to, re to kind of like remembering that process, kind of, you have a sense of pride. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I was wondering as well, because the sort of, 
decision as to go with ice. I, th I thought it was more just like he was a polar opposite to Scorpion. Man, and I don't think anybody ever thought of that, but could be. But when we were doing, well, too, like with even with Scorpion, like, blow, you know, a Scorpion's going to blow flame on you and you're yeah. going to get lit up. And then I did it a couple of times. I looked at John and said, I'm not doing this anymore. And John is like, don't be an asshole. Why are you not doing this anymore? I go, because if I do this, my cotton mask will be on fire and then I'll be running around with my head. <laughs> and then John is like, he, he's like, I got an asshole, pull the mask down. So I do it a couple of times. And then Rich looks at me and he goes, it would be cool. Rich is even to this day, deathly afraid of skeletons. Skeletons are the creepiest thing. Could be the devil, could be Freddy Krueger. He doesn't have a problem with any of the, any of those. <laughs> he has a problem with skeletons. So for him, he's like, it would be cool if he pulls his head off and he's a skeleton. And I'm like, oh, and he's like, and he's like Ghost Rider and his head's on fire. You know, and so that's how, you know, just goofing around with that. That's how like that different things happen. So even when I see that, I start cracking up because I was like, who in the hell would be like that? Who in the hell would tell, I'm not doing this anymore because my head would be on fire. Who just to give the guy shit, you know, because <laughs> I was doing shit, you know, over it. You know? so, uh. so recently you've, you've reprised your role as Johnny Cage. Uh, in the movie Mortal Kombat Legends Never Die, and you've also played Shang Tsung in the back in the uh, in the past for the fan made film. Um, what was it? Mortal Kombat uh, Fate's Beginning. Would you reprise any of your roles in any of the games if there was a chance to do it again, or or has there ever been any uh, contact with you to do that sort of thing? Uh, yeah, I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't think there would be any contact because that would open the door to everything that happened. Mm -hmm, right. That, that technically, you know, a lot of their, you know, uh, being there, you know, not only from my point of view, but, you know, if you talk to Hosung or Liz or Philip or Catalan or, or Rich, you know, you can't talk to my brother because he's, you know, they have him sealed up. Uh, Warner Brothers has him sealed up for the work he, he's done for them. But, uh, you know, if you talk to those guys, they're going to say the same story that I'm saying, and then it's going to be questionable whether they ever own the the IP. Mm, you know, yeah. and, and that would that acknowledgement means like, oh, guess what? Negotiation started. You know, it's a it's a multi billion dollar franchise. Oh, the uh, you know negotiation started at seven hundred million to be featured in your gamer movie. Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a little difficult price to start out at. A bit. About the money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, so so that is, I'm not saying that it's never, but that is a big, you know, they would, for them to come forward knowing that that might be, get out there, that they might have to recognize that is probably not a hurdle they would like to do, with, probably myself or any of the original cast, maybe some of the actors from like three, four, five, or, you know, or the movies, they could probably do that because they own their rights solid, solidly. But mm. for everybody else, probably not so much just because of that acknowledgement. You know, you're going to open that up. And I don't know if they want that open up. Mm. Mm. So, so you might probably see uh, characters from three, you know, the, the actors who did three or four uh, more likely than the actors who did one or two. Yeah, which we sort of have seen kind of in Mortal Kombat 11. Speaking of which, you did mention you, you're not into the games as much, which fair enough, but you did also say that you saw the latest movie. How about uh, any of the shows, Mortal Kombat Conquest, Mortal Kombat Legacy? Have you kept up to date in any way? I didn't watch any of those shows, you know? I watched the, you know, I, I kind of got heartbroken on the second Mortal Kombat, original Mortal Kombat movie. Mm -hmm. We all, we all yeah. were. <laughs> it was a money grab. You know, it was, cool to see <laughs> some of my, it was cool to see some of people I knew in number one. Mm. And two, again, with the stories of the creation, you know, I really enjoyed that. But number two, I was just like, uh, the Annihilation, I was just like, so when Conquest came out, I was just like, you know what, I'm not, it, those are just money grabs again. Because I could see what direction it's going in. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> I'm going to spend my money. It's going to be on cheap martial art movies or horror movies. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. So I'm not going to go see that. But you know, the new movie. I thought that you know, I like the actors. I liked uh, 
I like some of the things, but I think that, you know, for me, they should get a director who is a fan. It seems like Marvel, uh, you know, gets directors who are fans of the franchise as opposed to just think that they're going to create, you know, yeah, Mortal, Kombat's yeah. already, Mortal Kombat's already created. So for you to think that, oh, I'm going to create it. Nah, no, it's already created. And that's what people like. You know what I mean? They might not like your take on what you think it should be because there is already uh, something to to scale it up to, to match it up with an expectation already. So, you know, for me, I like the actors and like that. I didn't like that some of the main people died without the tournament happening. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't like that. I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't like that. It felt a little rushed just because when I'm looking at the stages, you know, it looks like they only had three or four basic basic backgrounds yeah yeah you know uh, uh, come on you get this billions of dollars make a different set you know apparently <laughs> not the budget was apparently much smaller than we all expected it to be that might well, have been one big reason why well well don't do that yeah because you know agreed <laughs> billion dollar franchise just because you know that mortal kombat fans will see it no matter what doesn't mean you should stick their your hand in their pocket agreed you guys you got to give them something for it because you know that's why I, I I'm go to conventions. People come out to see me because Mortal Kombat fans are different than a lot of other fans. Mm -hmm. They will come see. They'll come just hang out with me, you know. And I like it. Yeah, you know, I like going there and seeing just talking. You just talk about life. You know, they talk about a little bit, of, not more Mortal Kombat directly, but what Mortal Kombat how during their youth. Yeah, what, how it shaped them or what how when they fan or you know it brings their life story and I like to hear that. Yeah. Well, uh, Master Pacina, do you have any other ongoing projects that you'd like to share with our viewers? Um, just, you know, uh, watch out for the documentary. We don't know a name, but, you know, we're, we'll get the teaser out there when it's ready. Uh, you know, just look out for that just to kind of get a different perspective of, you know, you know, you hear the company perspective, but just get a uh, different perspective from the actual actors or the people who were were invited in uh, pre-project, you know, nice. pre-project pre just to get that. You know, people can find uh, find me on social media, Facebook, Master Piscina, get my plugs in. <laughs> uh, 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 Instagram, Master D Piscina, I'm mostly there. Um, I'm, I was on Twitter. I'll probably go back to it once I figure out, you know, what I really want to say on, on Twitter. I think I'm going to make yeah. it more. Yeah, I think it's going to be more of like the focus about uh, martial arts and like, not only that about how to make it unique for the industry, because when I see Mortal Kombat, I see what I created 30 years ago. And when I see the new ones, I'm like, dude, you, they're still doing the same thing. Mm. You know, sure, it's faster and the graphics are better and the play is designed better. But the general movement, you know, and I understand that people don't, you know, don't want to change stuff. But I think you could change some of the. Uh, fighting part of it, some of the physical fighting part of it, you know, mm. to improve that a little bit. So, yeah, so we're going to do that. Right. Well, before we let you go, we want to ask what is your favorite finisher? Fatality, brutality? My favorite finisher is, is the kiss of death from Sonya. Uh, you, you know, not, you know, sure, it's, uh, when people see it, it's cool. But again, the genuine sto that story behind it mm -hmm. is because, you know, you know, out of that story is the friendship comes out of that and just comes like uh, to the story of like, oh, guess what? You can you can't you can rip somebody's heart out or pull their spine out, but you can't kiss somebody on the cheek. That's, <laughs> that's, 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 not, that's, a, that's exactly right? what we've been saying for so long. It's like this it's this culture of. Gore is okay, but anything somewhat sexual in nature is like, oh, we can't go there. It's like, really? <laughs> Why is that the limit? Yeah, so that when I see that, I do that. Not only because I created it, but because of that, you know, the whole story behind it, how, how it was, it was, you know, how it was like, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, we're ripping people's heart out. <laughs> you know? Well, Master Pacino, we'd like to thank you so much for joining us uh, today on the Romecast. It's thank been a you. pleasure to have you on. Yeah, it's good seeing you. Nice meeting you, uh, Yanni. Timo, good to see you again, as always. 
Thank you. It was great to see you. And we'd like to thank all of our listeners for stopping by the Realmcast today. You can find Yanni and myself, Phantom, on the Mortal Kombat group on Facebook, as well as Yanni on the Mortal Kombat meme realm. Special thanks to Uppercut Editions for the continued support. You can follow them at Uppercut LLC on Twitter and the Mortal Kombat Encyclopedia Project on Facebook. You can catch up on all episodes of the Realmcast on YouTube, Facebook, iTunes, and Spotify. Thank you.